Good afternoon. Awesome, perfect. Welcome, thank you all for being here. I'm Catherine Klosak, Director of Information Policy at the Association of Research Libraries, ARL. I wanna thank CNI for hosting this important conversation. And I wanna thank you all for being here as you find your seats. In just a moment, we're gonna hear from representatives of foundations and federal science funding agencies um, here in the US that support research infrastructure, humanities research, higher education, and cultural heritage initiatives. And as a panelist share their insights on trends and priorities that they're observing, um, listen for common trends around working toward equity and taking new approaches to addressing global challenges. We're gonna uh, hopefully save some time for Q&A at the end. And we're gonna kick things off um, with pre-recorded remarks from Martin Halbert at the National Science Foundation. Hi, I'm Martin Halbert, the NSF Science Advisor for Public Access in the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure. And I'm delighted to share a few thoughts with you today. In this very brief set of comments, I'd like to just observe a few uh, things in the environment and what they are, uh, how I'm tracking them in terms of intersecting trends and questions concerning scientific communication. I'm going to talk briefly about the CHIPS Act, NSPM 33, and the 2022 OSTP Nelson Memorandum. The CHIPS Act uh, was a major piece of legislation that uh, has interjected a very large amount of new research funding into the uh, scientific ecosystem uh, with an investment over a period of years of more than $280 billion in new funding that's going to be made available through NSF, NIST, NASA, and other federal agencies it is going to have enormous effects in terms of boosting domestic research, especially in the manufacture of semiconductors. Um, it was spurred by a global semiconductor shortage and widespread concerns that the United States was falling behind in semiconductors and science generally. Now, the point, in addition to just the basic impacts that this act is going to have on uh, scientific research across the nation over a long period of time. I do want to highlight some parts of the mem of the uh, act that are, are less well known. In addition to allocating all that money, CHIPS made many statements about the importance of research reliability, reproducibility, and public access. I draw your attention to section 10344 and invite you to look at some of the statements there. I'll come back to CHIPS, the CHIPS Act in just a moment. Uh, NSPM 33 is a very complex and somewhat controversial national security presidential memorandum that directs agencies to strengthen protections of uh, U.S. government supported research against foreign government interference and exploitation. Now, it was motivated by concerns that uh, the U.S. government needs to take steps to protect the intellectual capital and discourage research misappropriation of U.S. Uh, taxpayer dollars and the uh, resulting research coming out of that. Now, an interesting sidebar to this is a, uh, an effect it is having of making persistent identifiers, um, for example, ORC IDs, required for individual researchers to obtain federal research grants in coming years. Now, that the, um, while the overall gist of this memorandum was around uh, protecting U.S. Uh, research investments, it is actually having an a, uh, interesting synergistic sidebar effect of uh, moving forward federal agency mandates around ORC IDs, which is going to have an interesting um, strong effect on uh, better sharing of, of research results in terms of uh, tracking 
uh, researchers uniquely through ORC IDs. Again, I'll come back to this in a moment. Finally, the uh, 2022 OSTP Nelson Memorandum that has gotten a lot of attention uh, recently, which was issued just on, October, on August 25th uh, by Dr. Alondra Nelson in OSTP, has obviously um, made a number of new public access requirements, uh, notably the emphasis on free, immediate, and equitable access to research results. It calls for default zero embargo of peer-reviewed articles after publication together with data undergirding such publications. Now, you've undoubtedly heard a lot about this memorandum and you're probably gonna hear more about it in this panel. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through the details. Let me just make a few comments about these three uh, developments in the field and how I see them as interconnected in various interesting ways. Um, first, a trend that I'm tracking of renewed attention on the United States as part of the global milieu. Uh, the CHIPS Act and NSPM 33 highlight in very different ways the scientific and economic anxieties of the, U of the United States with regards to the rest of the world. Now conversely, other nations do watch developments in the United States nervously at times, anticipating the impacts that developments like the Nelson Memorandum may have on science and many other areas internationally. I can attest that uh, groups like uh, Coalition S and Science Europe are uh, anxiously following the developments of uh, agency responses to the Nelson Memorandum because they see the impacts of decisions made in the United States on the overall global scientific communication ecosystem. So my questions that I've been thinking about a lot lately is what's the right balance here? To what degree should we seek to integrate or separate US scientific communication systems with or from the rest of the world? Um, my second trend is a renewed attention on open science and public access results of federally funded research, perhaps an obvious one, but the Nelson Memorandum has set really a new bar for scientific information sharing. It called out the importance of immediate and free accessibility in, in order to respond to threats like the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. So my question here that we think a lot about in the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure is what investments and alignment of policies and practices are needed to realize the full potential of open science. Uh, I'm coordinating the NSF uh, response to the Nelson Memorandum, and I'm thinking a lot about this these days. The other thing I'll highlight is just a competition that you may have heard of, the Ferros RCN competition, NSF 22553, that I competed earlier this year around findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable open science research coordination networks. Quite a mouthful, but I'd encourage you to look at some of the awards that we made uh, in response to this solicitation. Finally, a re renewed attention on sustainability of interrelated systems. Um, there are many interrelated tensions in the extended scholarly communication ecosystem that center on sustainability today. Research programs, libraries, publishers, and other entities in this ecosystem are struggling to survive in constantly changing circumstances. So my questions that uh, I've been wondering about a lot is how should funders prioritize research investments to maximize social benefit? And what are the best strategies to improve scholarly communication systems? Um, these are obviously very broad questions, but I wanted to uh, set a, uh, a, a kind of a higher 30,000 foot view for to start the rest of the panel's uh, discussions. Thank you very much, uh, and I, hope I'll be able to join you for the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thanks, Martin. So Martin um, is planning to join us for the Q&A. We're gonna hear next from Bob Hanish. Bob, I'm pulling up your slides if you wanna Please. kick us off. So I Do you want to? You, you're welcome to. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what's going on around uh, open data, open science uh, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology 
or I am the director of the Office of uh, Data and Informatics. I want to talk a little bit about our public data repository, uh, then a little bit more about laboratory information management systems, and again, I thank Cliff for uh, teeing up this presentation for me about metadata capture at the source. Um, an update on our research data framework, which I spoke to you all about um, a year or two ago, and then uh, in, in following up sort of Martin's uh, introductory marks here mentioning the CHIPS Act, a word about data that cannot be open. So for open access, uh, again, the conformance with the OSTP Nelson memo, the good news at NIST is that we've just about done all of this work already. Uh, already stemming from the Holdren memo in, in 2013. And I came to NIST at about the same time and felt that it was really important to modernize uh, the way that NIST was uh, managing its research data outputs, uh, coming as I do from the astronomy community where we had made major strides in sharing, uh, sharing data from major research facilities. And, and so we started a program already eight years ago to uh, improve and open up access to the uh, outputs of our research. And I should just note, NIST is primarily an intramural research organization, but we do fund uh, a fair amount of external research as well. In terms of um, uh, additional work, it's really around the, uh, the persistent identifiers for the people that we fund. Uh, and also persistent identifiers for our own staff. We actually uh, passed a policy uh, now a year ago that requires our researchers to, to have an, an ORCID uh, for all their publications. Uh, the CHIPS program is going to tweak uh, NIST in a big way of that huge amount of money that Martin talked about. We expect around 11 billion will pass through the doors of NIST over the next five years. Our annual budget is less than one billion, so you can imagine that that is a huge uh, lever arm on the system. And uh, putting it politely or not so politely, it's created kind of a feeding frenzy around the campus. <laughs> so we're trying to deal with that and at the same time assure a fair life data life cycle. And then I'll give just a quick update on the research data framework. Our public data repository is located at data.nist.gov. Uh, one. Uh, uh, silver lining of the pandemic was that the amount of data that our staff put into the public data repository increased by an order of magnitude. They had lots of research results sitting in their labs. They couldn't get into their labs, and so they wrote up those results and published them and, and shared the data. Um, along with data, of course, is the software that is used to um, analyze it and reduce it. And we now have online our public source code repository, which is available at code.nist.gov. We have over 600, uh, might be 700 now, public uh, repositories on the NIST GitHub. And we can now, you can, you can search across all of those and also get download and usage statistics, including links to any associated data sets and publications. We've invested a lot in laboratory information management systems at NIST, uh, which is a way to basically capture uh, metadata, the conditions of an experiment, the sample being studied at the birth of that data. Um, so we want to preserve this information, track samples, and automate conversion uh, for, of the data from sometimes proprietary forms to open formats, and basically make the case that all data can be born fair. So it helps in the translation of data across space and time from one researcher to the next in terms of publication, but also from postdoc to graduate student, uh, so forth. You don't have to write down on a little sheet of paper that you stick onto a thumb drive what happened that day. It's all collected for you automatically. We built our own because we found that commercial systems like this are really designed for production work in areas like pharmaceuticals and are not very really adaptable to the very dynamic research environment that comes with, uh, in our case, running electron microscopes. Um, I'll mention briefly the research data framework. This is a project that we started in late 2019, is ongoing now, in which we are characterizing the players, the roles, responsibilities, uh, in the research data life cycle. And uh, again, I thank Cliff for, for teeing up this conversation up about preserve and discard, which is, of course, a very important part of the data life cycle. And we have been now talking with hundreds of representatives from 
uh, involved in research data uh, in one way or another, from management to bench scientists to curators to librarians to publishers, to understand where people spend most of their time and energy and how we can best uh, help people to understand where they are in the research data ecosystem. We've done a lot of work in the past year. We had 15 stakeholder workshops. Uh, we did a lot of restructuring of the topics and subtopics. And uh, we are now developing what are called profiles, which is where you identify your role. Uh, perhaps, you, perhaps you're a research librarian. These are the typical functions that research librarians have. And uh, here's who you can go to to understand uh, how your role intersects with people, other people's roles in the, in the, uh, in the system. We hope to uh, <clears throat> bring this to a conclusion in the, by the end of this fiscal year with version two of the research data framework. And the last thing I'll say is about data and the CHIPS Act. Um, Martin already set this up. Uh, this is going to involve relationships with the private sector, with industry, and it means that some data will be private or at least restricted. We already have systems for supporting restricted but public data where you have to basically register with us in order to get access. But we're going to have to look at further steps such as encryption and integrity validation uh, in consultation with our information technology security experts at NIST. And this is really critical for establishing trust in this research data. Industry needs to rely on us. We need to characterize this data so they know exactly in what circumstances it pertains, that its uncertainties are, are properly characterized. And we want to be, of course, consistent with FAIR principles, which are as open as possible, but as restricted as necessary. So thanks very much. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. And we'll hear from Terry next. Um, is this one? No. Yes? Can yes. we use the table mics? Can I? I think I can. Yeah, unless I have very large lungs. Great. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Terry Taylor from Lumina Foundation. And to be honest, I don't spend a lot of time with people like this network. Um, for me, ORC IDs are possibly World of Warcraft options. Um, but um, but I, I feel like we're in a time where building new relationships, understanding what's happening to higher ed as a field, um, and how we can all sort of work together to sort of develop more strategies. Um, funders uh, sit in these tensions where we're so careful to design our strategies, to meet the moment, to meet our grantees and other partners, but there are so many externalities and unpredictable events that can disrupt that. And it feels like right now, we're living in a particularly disruptive time. Um, democracy is black backsliding globally. Um, despite the midterms, we still have a rise of white supremacy, uh, uh, we still have a lot of hate happening on campus. Um, we see libraries and educators as battlefields, not as sort of neutral goods. Um, and it's hard for us, for those of us that were trained to be brought up in systems who take a lot of personal meaning in providing access to information, in teaching, in um, wrestling with complicated ideas, it's hard when that gets politicized. And so I think all of us have skills to build and relationships to build. Um, I'll just offer a couple of data points. 40% um, of Americans think that higher ed is part of the problem with our country. Um, uh, most, th most people across the political spectrum think that when faculty members teach a controversial topic, they're mostly providing their own opinion and they're not providing space for debate. Um, we can d dispute that, but it's what people believe. So I think it's important to think about some of this as we're figuring out our own strategies. Um, it's also worth noting that 39 million people with some college no degree, a population that Lumina has spent a lot of time on, um, that's sort of a democracy problem. That's a societal health problem. And so how do we help make sure people who come through our do doors are well served? And frankly, how do we help faculty and administrators see libraries and other resources as part of the solution, not just you know, the folks um, doing research over there? Um, for, if you know Lumina at all, um, since our CEO came on board in 2008, we, everything we've done has been designed around a national attainment goal of 60% of American adults having some kind of quality credential by 2025. Uh, when that was set, 2025 felt like a long, long time from now, and, and now it's, oh, two years away. <laughs> and so part of what we've been doing is something that philanthropy doesn't often do, which is think about its second act. And so part of my job as the director of innovation and discovery 
um, is to think about, we're defining that particularly in terms of what is education for and uh, what systemic risks is our country facing sort of outside of our core work of increasing uh, enrollment, increasing retention, increasing graduation rates, particularly for students of color and adults and other underserved populations. Um, what are the things that might get in the way of that? Um, both systemic risks that are threats to our country and to overall systems, but also to our own mission um, of att around attainment and equity. Um, we're also trying to figure out how to talk about those risks in terms of opportunity for how we talk about quality, how we talk about equity, how we talk about relevance. I think when we talk about value of higher education, that's more than just how much somebody pays. It's also what is society getting back for all the investment that we pay. Um, so let me give one example, and I think this is why I was invited to be on this, um, about divisive concepts. So if you all know, so quick history. Um, the Trump administration, in their last six months in office, put out um, uh, a policy saying that uh, the federal government would not pay for any training around certain defined divisive concepts. Um, I can go into that later, but basically it's a list of eight or nine things that then got rolled up into uh, model legislation that's now been passed by several states. Um, the, the, the federal policy went away in Biden's first day in office, but since then I think something Penn America has estimated it's like 121 million Americans now live in a state where there's some restriction in K-12 or higher ed. And there's eight or nine states now um, that have specific restrictions about higher ed, what can be taught. And there's also, I'm sure you all know, a bunch of book bans happening. And so all of this really limits what we can do. And, and to be honest, um, uh, I am deeply concerned that a lot of faculty don't really understand what's happening. They're getting um, mixed messages from their council. They are reading stuff in the news. And, I, you know, and so I think this is a place where, again, how do we help people understand what's going on? How do we help make meaning of this and design sort of collaborative strategies a big thing? Um, Lumina's role in this was, yeah, I'm a lawyer, and I was doing this innovation work, and I had this legal lab at the time. And, and so eight, about 18 or 20 months ago, I was like, well, let's do an analysis. Like, these things have to be unconstitutional, right? Like, let's ask. And then we sort of shared that analysis um, with a bunch of other funders, I should say. I will not say who they are. And everyone at first, about 14 months ago, was like, eh, this probably isn't our fight. Like, if we talk about it, won't it just add more fuel to the fire? It's only eight states. At the time, it was places like Idaho and Oklahoma. Um, so they're like, please don't do that. But, um, but we ended up being able to um, get a little bit more traction. And partly because a lot more bills got introduced at the beginning of this year, um, including specifically higher ed. There's been a blurring of boundaries um, between higher ed. There's, there's a lot more consequences now. Um, one of them has now been knocked out of court. You may have seen coverage of the, the Florida Stop Woke Act, which was almost so bad <laughs> that it was easier to challenge in court. But again, this takes resources. And what I've seen in that specific issue, that's not the only issue that we're talking about, but studying, paying attention to it early helped us in a couple ways. It helped us have better conversation across the foundation when we heard grantees coming to us with like, hey, you, you, you gave us some funding for equity training and um, equity decision making in our system or in our college, and we can't use those words anymore. So, um, or, uh, we are trying to figure out our let you know how to support our grantees working with legislators. Uh, are there places where if we do work in this state, we're going to have our own reputational problems because of some of the threats to higher ed? So it's really complicated and hard, actually. And those of us that really put a stake in the ground on behalf of racial equity, I think it's particularly important for us to think about how do we bring all these dynamics together. Um, so. Thinking about just how we meet the moment, I think funders can be helpful because we see the field in an interesting way. We, we have a lot of individual um, inflows with our grantees. We get to sort of see trends sometimes happening before our eyes. We get to talk to other funders and hear what they're thinking about. So that kind of helps us identify key issues. Um, I really hope we can work to help build and expand networks. Um, uh, for Libraries in my world for a while were like, a partner to reach adult learners in rural areas because that's where adult learners were getting online. Um, we did a little work on um, OER, um, but that's an overly limited um, view of what you all do. And so I think that there's a question of how do we all sort of work together. Um, there's also funders can give space to try new things. I'm excited to hear about the NEH programs um, that they are announcing. Um, and also really think hard about capacity and who's best positioned to do what now and in the future. I think we also like have to think about controversy. It's hard for funders sometimes to be 
seen as controversial at all. Our, bo our boards can get nervous <laughs> about that. Um, our grantees can get nervous about that. Um, but you know, at some point, what do we stand for? I think there's also a really important time for us to listen and uh, not just design strategies in a vacuum or what makes sense with our own stakeholders, but also to listen and try and understand what the field needs and where capacity needs to be created. So I was really happy to hear some of those similar ideas from other funders. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over. Thanks so much, Terry. Um, Brett, I'll tee up and run your slides if you wanna. I'll come up It's here. up to you. <laughs> if, if I can't see my slides, I'm doomed. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Uh, Brett Bobley with the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, I'm the Chief Information Officer, and I'm also the Director of our Office of Digital Humanities. I want to tell you about, you know, I've been with the NEH for about 25 years, and this is probably the boldest, most re remarkable new initiative we've, we've released in the time that I've been there. Uh, our Chair, Shelley Lowe, this is kind of her signature initiative, which we're calling American Tapestry. And uh, as I said, it's, it, it's a big deal. And let me talk to you a little bit about it. There, there are three pillars to this new initiative. The first one is called Strengthening Our Democracy. And it is very much about funding projects that are investigating democracy in the United States in its current state, potential decline of democracies around the world. So not just looking at what happened to democracy 200 years ago, but, but how does it reflect today's challenges? The second pillar of this new program is called Advancing Equity for All. And this is, again, as you can imagine, it is about funding projects that really look at studying equity, um, both internally and externally, I should note. Um, so fun funding projects that are exploring equity in politics, in, in, in life, um, economically, but also internally within the humanities. Uh, we're, taking, we're taking another look at, you know, what, what, what does the pool of our peer reviewers look like from an equity perspective? What does the pool of our grantees look like from an equity perspective? And the third pillar is called confronting the climate crisis. Um, so which, which, which I think is about the most direct way we could say that we're interested in projects that are looking at confronting the climate cr crisis. Um, <laughs> I, I say that, you know, and I, I'm only half joking because I, I think that it's fair to say that in the past the NEH has kind of shied away from advertising that we fund contemporary projects, projects that are attacking, addressing contemporary issues. But I think most of you would agree that if you look at some of the biggest challenges in the world today, a lot of them involve humans and they have a social dimension, right? Um, you know, as, as you know, Cliff allude, alluded to some of this earlier, but you know, obviously we, we science can, can make amazing vaccines, but maybe they can't understand why so many Americans don't want to take them, you know? Um, we really want to ensure that we are willing to address these sorts of issues. So let me tell you about a couple of the new grant programs which are, we have just announced that go along, that fall under this umbrella, this American tapestry umbrella. Uh, the first one I'm gonna talk about is one that's actually coming from my own office, the Office of Digital Humanities. Uh, it's called The Dangers and Opportunities of Technology, Perspectives from the Humanities. You know, so the idea here is that I think that in the digital humanities, in the, I, mean, I founded the Office of Digital Humanities about 15, 16 years ago. The lion's share of the projects that we have funded have been about turning the lens of technology onto the humanities, right? That is to say, how do we do philosophy research or humanities or, or, or history research or literature research using computers? How do we use computers to help us do research? That's the way we've, we've, we've almost always done it in the past. But the idea behind this program is to turn the lens around. We are now saying, what do the humanities have to say about technology? Um, technology, <laughs> there's all kinds of problems with technology. Um, you know, a lot of the thorniest problems we have today have a technological element to them. Uh, when it comes to things like disinformation, um, you know, medical research, um, AI, you know, the, almost every major thorny issue, cryptocurrency, democracy, there's this huge technological element to it. 
But it's not just a, it's not a computer science issue per se. It's not a science issue per se. There's this human element to it. And we want to get scholars from the humanities bringing their voices to the fore, writing articles, writing books, being in the public eye to talk about what are the ramifications to people of these, these new technologies. That's kind of what this new program is about. Here are just a few random examples of the sort of research topics that we might want people to look at. Again, things like data privacy, wealth inequality, crypto, supply chains, streaming economy, all these things that really have a humanities element to them. But they are also things that I think it's fair to say the NEH did not call out in the past. You could always technically come to the NEH and try to get a grant for one of these things, but not very many people did. I think there was a perception in the field that, oh, the NEH isn't going to fund that. It's too controversial. It's too hot button of an issue. And may, maybe, maybe it was. I don't know. But our new chair under the Biden administration really wants to ensure that humanities research plays a critical role here. And, and, and by the way, Bob, if you guys are having any trouble spending that $11 billion in chips money, <laughs> I just give me a call. Yeah. All right. We're good. Um, this new grant program um, has two levels uh, of application. If you are an individual researcher in the humanities, you can get up to 75K. If you are a research team, you can get up to 150K. And by the way, I should note, you, you don't have to be a professional researcher in the humanities to apply. You could be a scientist. You could be anybody. Um, but you have to be taking a humanities perspective in your research. Uh, deadline is February the 2nd. It'll be an annual program. Uh, that'll go on forever or until we are shut down. Uh, a few other programs I want to tell you about that, again, under this umbrella of the American Tapestry program. This is one in our Division of Education programs. It's called Spotlight on the Humanities in Higher Education. And this is really about supporting smaller organizations. So this is not something for the Harvards and the Yales. This is specifically we're looking at um, community colleges, smaller HBCUs, regional uh, comprehensive universities, um, organizations like that that need extra support um, who are interested in, 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 a, in a variety of different types of topics that are, 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 are open. This particular program had its deadline last month. It'll, it'll, the next deadline will be next November. Another new program in our Division of Public Programs this is one that will be coming up in, in, in June. Uh, this, this, again, this is looking at um, smaller organizations in the public domain. We, you know, in addition to funding research, the NEH also funds a lot of public programming, things like museums and historical associations and libraries. And this particular program is aimed at smaller organizations uh, across the country. Um, our Division of Research Programs has made a few changes, important changes, to some of their grant programs. Um, for example, the Summer Stipends Program, which is a program to help scholars get like two months of pay over the summer to do research. We're making some changes to make it easier for um, certain organizations like tribal organizations, PBIs, HBCUs, and others to apply for summer stipends. Um, similarly, in our collaborative research program, um, we are making some changes in particular to encourage universities to partner with smaller organizations, including HBCUs, tribal colleges, community colleges, and the other, to try to do research bringing in these um, um, other organizations that are, that are not as financially solvent as them. Okay. Our Office of Challenge Grants has a new program called Climate Smart Humanities. And this is specifically for strategic climate action and adaptation plans. So this might be, for example, an organization that has a, an archive or a library, maybe in a flood zone. And maybe they haven't had a flood yet, but they realize that in 10 or 20 years they might. And this, this is a program to give them money to bring in consultants to help put in a long-term plan for preserving and, and, and addressing those sorts of issues. Um, our Preservation and Access Division has a new program called Cultural and Community Resilience. And this is about um, specifically looking at both COVID-19 and climate change and helping to document and safeguard the culture of, of people around the country. So as you can see, this, this is pretty unprecedented for the NEH to release like six new grant programs in this course of a year. It, it, it's kind of a, a big deal for us. So a uh, very wide variety of things there. Um, I'm going I'm to stop here. Um, I'll also note, just for the record, since there's been a lot of talk about the, the, the Nelson memo, I, as, in my role as CIO, I'm also sort of one of the point people for the OSTP memo. And we're looking at how the NEH 
will be able to um, comply with and, 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 and take part in the, in, in the open science arena. So this is some, some things I'm working on, and that's all I got. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Brett. <clears throat> Patricia, I can pull up and run your slides if you're ready. If you want to start. Oh, you start? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, well, um, it's always a pleasure to be on the same panel as you, Brett, because you are a hard act to follow. Um, I know the NEH is doing some really cool stuff under the leadership of Shelley Lowe, and so it was re really inspiring to get that update. I'm Patricia Sway, I'm the Program Officer for Public Knowledge at the Mellon Foundation, and um, I'll just be providing a high-level overview about the foundation and our program, especially its strategies. If there were slides, we would be advancing to the next one, which would um, show uh, a quotation um, that is on our website. Mellon is the, this is not the quotation, so you were supposed to read the quotation and I was supposed to um, uh, give this script. Mellon is the largest private philanthropy addressing needs in the arts and humanities. Uh, since it was established in 1969, we have made more than 18,000 grants totaling $8 billion in support of the arts and humanities. To get a sense of the grants we have made, you can go do searches in our grants database at our website um, at uh, melon.org. On the, okay, so slide three, please, Catherine. Thank you. The arts and humanities are expansive domains, so it may not come as a surprise that we have several program areas that focus on specific areas in the arts and humanities. Um, through its grant making, for example, arts and culture bolsters creative practice, scholarship, and conservation practices while also fostering an arts and culture ecosystem that is representative of the wide variety of artists and or organizations um, represented by or in the, represented in the field. Higher learning is the program area that works with colleges, universities, and other organizations in higher education. Among their goals is to increase uh, our understanding of American history and culture, develop the tools and methods for interpretation that researchers can use to create meaning, and design opportunities for those seeking to lead these institutions in transformative ways. Humanities in Place is the foundation's newest program intended to amplify and care for the places and cultural sites and structures necessary to a fuller, more complex telling of American histories and lived experiences. And finally, public knowledge. My program supports those who steward and make available to the public the knowledge embodied in humanities scholarship and cultural record. We care largely about this stuff the primary source materials, for example, that enable the evidence building and interpretation that much about teaching, research, and learning in the humanities pivot on. We care about the infrastructures uh, and tools that support access to and use of the stuff, and we want to ensure that there are partnerships and collaborations to help ensure, to help make sure that the created infrastructure is robust and able to endure. Next slide, please. So in addition to our four program areas, our president, Elizabeth Alexander, has created two initiatives that her office makes grants to support. Uh, one is an effort you may have heard of called the Monuments Project, which is a $250 million grant-making initiative um, over four years to transform the nation's commemorative landscape through public po projects that are representative of the multiplicity and complexity of American stories. And then the other initiative is um, for Puerto Rico, and that initiative is accomplishing three things. It is creating sustainable cultural opportunities for artists, curators, uh, educators, and other culture workers. It is building capacity by strengthening local and diasporic arts, culture, and humanities organizations. And it is helping to elevate voices and fortifying networks by lifting up the scholarly and cultural contributions of previously marginalized voices in Puerto Rico. Next slide, please. So prior to 2020, public knowledge was a scholarly communications program. That year, the foundation adopted an explicit social justice framework to our grant making, which essentially means that we aim to support those efforts that are solving problems of inequity in order to create a more just and fair society. And for public knowledge, this change has meant a broadening of the types of organizations we make grants to and the communities that these organizations help nurture. Next slide. 
Before I proceed further about the program, I did want to give you a little um, a list of the people who work in this program. So uh, Michael um, and I are primarily focused on the pre-award side of grant making, while uh, Celia and Chandra are focused on the post-award side of things. And we have a research associate, um, a new role, who through her assignments and projects is helping the program get a finer understanding of gaps and needs in the sectors we support to inform our social justice grant making, and that's Julia. Next slide. The public knowledge program cares about equitable access and on the other side of that coin, access that may need to be controlled for cultural sensitivity purposes. And so to this end, we make grants in accordance with three strategies that are li listed at left um, in order to solve problems and challenges that resonate with areas and activities on the right. And I did go there with the word cloud, which um, I know is um, a rather dated way of representing information, but I did want you to see that there are emphases um, that the program um, is addressing. Next slide. Through our grants addressing preservation, for example, we strive to ensure the authenticity and value of original sources in the process of documenting and preserving them in all formats, including web-based content. So web archiving is still important to the program with focus on materials from historically underrepresented cultures and populations. Next slide. Through our grants that address maintenance and sustainability, we aspire to maintain and improve the technology, the tools, and infrastructure needed for the public to readily access knowledge, resources related to the foundation's social justice mission. Um, it's important to us that while we are continuing to innovate with new tools and new technologies, that we also pay attention to those tools and technologies that have been in existence for a while and have um, communities that use them and need them. In addition, we're concerned with financial health and resilience for organizations that are central to the sectors that we care about and that our grants encompass. So to this end, we've made um, change capital grants to several organizations, cultural heritage organizations in the last couple of years. Next slide. Through our grants that address networks and sharing, we aim to establish and strengthen interdependent networks and services for exposing and sharing hidden or little known information, resources, and collections. And this strategy shows our commitment to nurturing collaborations and partnerships when it comes to solving system-wide problems because we know distributed solutions are likely to last longer than standalone ones. Next slide. So about our process, Mellon invites grant proposals, but there are a variety of ways that in which we've also been lowering barriers for our grantees, and some of them are listed here. So we do have an online inquiries portal where you can submit ideas uh, for consideration. Um, and from that point, um, if we accept the, the, um, the sort of two paragraphs <laughs> of um, expressing your ideas, then we may invite a concept note. Uh, we hold open calls from time to time. Public knowledge was when it was the Scarlet Communications Program, conducted the foundation's first open call for proposals, and that was to um, community-based archives. We've also held what's known as a limited submission concept note call, and um, our higher learning program uh, experimented with this this year. Um, focusing on sending out this call to hundreds of institutions, asking them to submit um, calls or concept notes that addressed either civic engagement um, or race and racism uh, or literary imagination and social justice. And um, it was quite successful in terms of the submissions that they received. We've done something similar in the past. Um, we have collaborated with the arts and culture program um, to do a, a similar call to um, academic institutions that have campus museums and libraries and that share um, mutual challenges or that have mutual challenges in need of solutions. Um, in addition, we've been doing a lot of outreach and engagement um, to new organizations that include public libraries um, that are embraced by the tribal library community and um, that are nonprofits that are infrastructure focused um, and community archives and so on. Next slide, please. So lowering barriers for grantees means being transparent about our practice and our processes. If you go to the Mellon website, we now have a section that details our proposal process, complete with this flowchart graphic. Um, next slide. And a final point to make is that the foundation revised its proposal guidelines um, over the summer so that the guidance across all program areas are similar 
um, rather than you know, starkly different. And to save time, I won't go into de details about the changes, but I will say in sum that the various mechanisms that Mellon is using to attract proposals have increased in complement to the convention of inviting them. We've become more transparent about our process, and we've streamlined the proposal development process so grantees are not burdened with excessive document requirements um, and excessive information requests. Um, to give you an idea of where we have streamlined, we also now have page limits on our proposal narratives. So for smallish um, grants that are in the range of dollars to $150,000, uh, we require a proposal nar narrative that is only two to three pages. Um, for grants that will be considered by our board of trustees, that um, page range is like five to 10 now. So um, that is what I have to say about um, our program, and thank you so much. Thank you, Patricia. And uh, Daryl will give us the last word. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us this afternoon, and uh, thank you to Catherine for the invitation to serve on this panel. I've really appreciated hearing the, uh, the presentations by my colleagues. Um, I'm Daryl Meadows. I'm with the National Historical Publications and Records Commission. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, we are a, a small, but I say mighty, funding agency um, associated with the National Archives. We were created right alongside the archives in 1934, and we've been making grants since 1964. Um, you can find us at archives.gov forward slash NHPRC. Um, I wanted to talk about sort of where we are as an organization. We're uh, very much in a learning and reflective mode. Um, we fund primarily on the record side, that's the R in our acronym, uh, small and large archives uh, who are largely processing archival collections, making access happen in various kinds of ways. On the publishing side of the house, traditionally we have funded what I would call uh, historical edition projects like the Founding Fathers projects, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, so we've been making grants along these lines since 1964, on the record side since the early 70s. And recently, uh, I think we have begun to uh, really think about uh, our grant program portfolio and the degree to which it is or is not uh, meeting our equity goals that are embedded both in our strategic plan as, but as, as well um, sort of charged to us from the presidential order on uh, racism in the federal government. Uh, so I wanted to talk about a couple of areas uh, that we're currently engaged uh, that are informing very much uh, where we where we think we are headed without pre you know without uh, sort of previewing uh, answers we're, we're seeking uh, um, opportunities to listen um, one of the ways in which we are learning a tremendous amount uh, is through uh, several actually four programs that are very explicitly trying to foster what I like to call mutually beneficial and respectful collaboration. So on the record side, we have what used to be called the Major Initiatives Program. It's now called the Major Archival Collaboratives Program, which fundamentally uh, seeks to fund collaborations uh, with an eye to um, digitizing and making accessible uh, important collections that are geographically dispersed, uh, that are not easy for re researchers to get to. We think there's a lot of work and thinking around uh, creating uh, virtual collections uh, that, are, that, that are important to be thinking about. And it's not just the technological infrastructure for that, but in all of these programs, we're concerned about what is the human infrastructure that we're fostering here. Um, another program called Archival Collaboratives uh, is a smaller program that has a planning track and an implementation track. When we first conceived of that um, pro program, we thought maybe it would work in a regional sort of way where maybe an R1 would take the lead and uh, collaborate with smaller institutions um, 
for those institutions perhaps to have access to digital infrastructure that they lack, to gain expertise, perhaps training, to be able to do a number of things that smaller institutions cannot readily do uh, on their own. Uh, I will say, but that's not exactly what we're seeing. We are seeing really interesting collaborations come together, but they tend to be collaborations among smaller institutions. Um, there is room in this program to see some R1s and other uh, sort of better resourced uh, institutions get involved. But I think there's, there's just interesting things that we're seeing and learning through this uh, program. Um, on the publishing side, much of my own thinking in this area actually comes from a program that I developed uh, and it, that is funded through the Mellon uh, Foundation. That's a regrant program called the NHPRC Mellon Planning Grants for Collaborative Digital Editions. That program explicitly is about fostering collaborations that are about creating robust edition projects that center historical materials that tell the stories of African Americans, Latinx communities, uh, Native Americans, uh, Asian Americans, um, and broadly the field of digital ethnic studies. So through these kinds of collaborative programs, um, we are seeking to foster whenever possible collaborations that help to bridge longstanding institutional inequalities by promoting resource sharing and capacity building at all levels. Um, in the planning grant program that I'm overseeing, I've now spoken to somewhere in the order of 30 to 40 potential planning teams. And many of the folks that I'm talking to are at small institutions, they are at community centers that have, because they are a trusted place, they have in effect become archives. But what I'm seeing through these conversations is frankly a whole host of need that we, I know in our programs, are not currently uh, meeting, but that raise really important questions for us to be thinking about. Um, so one of the things we also are trying to do through these collaborative uh, programs is to encourage projects that build in meaningful community and user engagement into their plans. Um, in a lot of my conversations with folks, um, perhaps at you know, a leading university somewhere, someone in the, in the library or a scholar at that university um, is proposing a collaboration with particular communities, we want to see those applicants engaging with those communities from the very beginning. So through our interactions with them, we're trying to uh, stimulate uh, this kind of uh, collaborative behavior. Uh, the other area that I wanted to talk about is, um, so the, the Mellon program came along a little before this, but the, the president's uh, ex executive order um, which mandated all federal agencies on the executive side to create what we are calling at NARA our equity action plan. Uh, those plans were approved by OMB in the White House last April and they were made public. Um, NHPRC played a pivotal role in the creation of NARA's equity plan and I was very proud to serve on that committee uh, and work toward those goals. Um, for NHPRC, the outcome of that was two uh, very explicit action items, one of which we have now more or less uh, completed. That was an action item to engage in listening tours, listening sessions uh, with practitioners of color, uh, diverse folks across, uh, across the United States in a variety of uh, organizations and institutions to really put on the table um, how can we ensure that our professional development programs are serving a more diverse audience. So we have two longstanding programs. Uh, one, what was uh, traditionally called the Editing Institute or the Institute for the Editing of Historical Documents, which goes back to the 1970s, and the Archives Leadership Institute, which we've been running since about 2008 or 9. In both of those instances, we uh, 
heard from uh, archivists of color and scholars of color um, really important uh, insights around our grants, the way they're structured, uh, the way they're advertised, um, and thinking about these uh, particular uh, professional development programs, uh, frankly, whether or not folks really felt that these programs were for them. So uh, that process, which uh, took place over about the last year and a half or so, uh, really informed some rethinking. Uh, we are now entertaining applications for both of those programs for their next iteration, and we are looking forward to seeing those programs um, in their new transformed state uh, in 2024, 2023 and 2024. Uh, and finally, and this is a, a bit of an appeal to you as well, if, if there are folks uh, that you know and you're engaged with who are similarly engaged in this kind of equity outreach, um, I, I'd love to hear from you. Our, our second action item is really just in the planning stages. We're gearing up for what we're calling a program-wide listening tour. We expect um, to sort of learn from the process of that first um, action item to really refine uh, and, and be a little more thoughtful uh, about the rollout of this. Uh, so we're, we're just really beginning to think through how we want to uh, plan this out. But we're expecting that at the end of this process, perhaps a year and a half or so down the road, um, what we will learn in this process, we expect uh, to shape discussions with our commissioners, with staff, and our thinking and decision making around our entire portfolio. Do we need to substantively, substantively revise programs? Do we need to create new programs? Uh, what about archival training uh, and other kinds of training uh, support for community archiving, for projects that are linked to community scholarship uh, efforts? Uh, what's our role in that? We expect that this effort will push us uh, to be even more reflective uh, than we've been in the last year or so about our application process, about our peer review and its purposes, whose interests is it serving? Is it serving a gatekeeping role? Um, and in general, the role of program officers in really providing upfront advising to folks at smaller institutions who've never before attempted to uh, apply to, for federal funding. Um, and it should really revolutionize our outreach and communication strategies. So whether through new or substantively revised programs, how we do how we uh, better serve and support uh, diverse archival institutions and communities of practice, including, um, again, folks in the emerging field of community archiving, um, whose historical records and access to them are essential to those communities, as well as to telling more complete American histories. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we are right on time. Um, but, and I think there's a break next. But um, if folks are willing, I think we're maybe willing to hang out for a question or two. Of course, if folks run for the door, that's our, our signal. Um, we can wrap it up. Um, does anyone have a, a pressing question? I think panelists included um, uh, contact info in their slide decks, which will be made as avail available as well if you want to reach out directly. Um, then please join me in thanking um, the panelists and CNI and the tech heroes in the back. Thank you guys. Um, thank you all.